Oh, thank you. I need it. <laughs> so uh, there was, uh, uh, we talked a little bit about fl uh, fluctuating dark matter um, uh, in the first part. And then there was a, a very good question by uh, somebody in the audience about what uh, actually happens when you approach this 10 to minus 21, 10 to minus 22 limit when the de Broglie wa wavelength becomes um, uh, comparable to the size of the galaxy. Uh, would the fluctuations be the same? And uh, Abhishek and I had a nice discussion uh, during the break. And uh, uh, perhaps there is uh, another regime, sort of, to think about it. One uh, regime that uh, most of the uh, experiments we discussed uh, are is when you know you have a whole bunch of axions um, in different random states. But when you start to have the Broglie wavelengths comparable to the size of the galaxy, maybe the best way to think about it as sort of this gravitationally bound um, uh, atom um, ma made of axions. And then uh, eventually probably the only the, 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 uh, the this is a very shallow potential, I guess, and, and eventually you will have only one state available and then uh, the other ones will uh, fly away. And then um <coughs> the coherence should go up again. But I think it's a very interesting uh, problem to tr uh, to sort of to trace how the the two regimes go one into another. Maybe we we should work on this, Abhishek, and uh, try to clarify this um, a little bit better. Okay. Good. Uh, so the the next uh, uh, topic we should discuss um, is atomic clock uh, searches for scalar dark matter. And for me, uh, this began uh, with uh, uh, actually uh, a paper. Um, by Asimina Arvanitaki um, and, uh, and her students. Um, that was called Searching for Dilaton Dark Matter with Atomic Clocks. And uh, the observation uh, in this paper was the following. That, uh, first of all, dilatons, uh, to, to remind you, are uh, spin zero uh, scalar particles. Uh, that appear somehow in the uh, string theory. And uh, if we have uh, a, a background of these particles uh, uh, around, this, this could look effectively uh, as changing of fundamental constants, for instance, uh, the fine structure constant alpha. And then they said, well, if alpha is changing, uh, you should be able to uh, do atomic clock uh, comparison and, and see how this is uh, changing. And they, they proposed that, um, and uh, when this happened, uh, uh, I had a, a, a brilliant postdoc, um, Nathan Leifer, uh at that time, um, and uh, and he said, "Well, uh, uh, great, uh, this is a great idea, uh, and uh, we don't do or need to do uh, any experiments because we have data." Uh, uh, on tape, so to say, on, on, on the disk. So this is one of these couch uh, experiments as well, where Asimina and company did the theory, and we ourselves did the experiment before, and then we, we could bring them uh, together. And the experiments uh, that we did was that, in fact, um, uh, we, we had an atomic uh, system, and this is an atom of dysprosium. It's a very special uh, atom because it's, it has a super complicated spectrum. It's one of these rare Earths with open F shells. But uh, there is a, a, an interesting coincidence, uh, if you believe in coincidences in nature. Maybe, maybe it's somebody's intelligent design <laughs> to give us uh, the two uh, opposite, parity, opposite nominal parity levels, um, A and B here, that are very, very close uh, uh, together. So there's uh, uh, there are different uh, isotopes and hyperfine components uh, uh, in this system. Uh, so the, the separation depends on the isotope and the, and the specific hyperfine component. But the closest one is about 3 megahertz. And this is like a 300 times better degeneracy than the famous 2s1 half to p1 half in hydrogen. So it's really, really closely degenerate levels. And then actually you can you can play games with this system because you apply a very weak magnetic field and you can shift the levels so you have um, actually opposite parity levels that are nominally degenerate. This is a very interesting system. But one of the um, uh, things that we did, we did 
a lot of different experiments uh, with dysprosium over the years and are continuing to do them. And this was an idea uh, proposed by Victor Flambaum uh, and company that this uh, system could be useful for measuring variations of alpha. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, we, we uh, had one of the best uh, results that has since been superseded by many others of magnitude by other atomic clock experiments, but for a while we were nearly the champions in this game. Um, and, and what we were looking for is uh, very slow uh, variations of alpha over years, uh, 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 say, uh, time scale. So what, uh, what um, uh, Nathan Leifer um, um, said is that, oh, um, as Asimina Arvanitaki and company, they are predicting not, uh, not just a, a, a so, sort of a monotonic drift uh, of alpha, but effective oscillation of alpha. Let's go back to our data and see what we can do with it. Um, and in fact, uh, we did this. Uh, we joined forces with one of her uh, students, Ken Van Tilburg. Uh, you may know this name. He's a pretty famous guy in this field currently. He was at that time a graduate student at Stanford. This is Nathan Liefer, and that was also uh, Lee Kurgas Buhas, who is still um, a member of our group uh, at Mainz at that time. This was at Berkeley. Uh, and we, to, uh, with these guys, uh, uh, we, we, we actually looked uh, at uh, the data sets that we had uh, recorded. And th there was um, one long uh, data set from 2010, 2012, and another one was about one month long. And we were um, able to, to set um, uh, some, some, some limits uh, on uh, a, a possible uh, coupling strengths uh, of this uh, dilaton, assuming that all the dark matter, all this 0.4 uh, uh, GeV per centimeter cube we, we've been hearing about all day uh, is due to these uh, dilatons. And uh, it turns out that you can also uh, uh, extract some limits from uh, equivalence uh, uh, principle uh, tests, and, and we did uh, much better. And at that time, actually, we, uh, we uh, thought that 10 to minus two, uh, 22 Electron volt is a, is is a, a, such a hugely fringe activity to look for such uh, such light uh, dark matter, and we were super surprised when we uh, uh, published this or put this on the archive. We got calls from famous people and who said, "Oh, 10 to minus 22 electron volt is actually our favorite uh, mass for dark matter because it's like the fuzzy dark matter. We love it, and uh, so it's very good that you are looking there." So that's interesting. Anyway, uh, so this was a, a, a couch experiment, so we didn't have to, to actually do new measurements. And in the paper, when we published it, we said, um, you know, when, uh, when, when uh, uh, somebody does this seriously with uh, the best atomic clocks, uh, you can actually do several orders of magnitude better. And in fact, very quickly, uh, maybe a year uh, after our paper, uh, the uh, people have uh, come to the line that we predicted, and in fact, um, uh, and in fact, uh, did uh, a better job here. So, th so that was uh, 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 maybe the first um, experimental uh, search for for this scalar dark matter using atomic clocks, and uh, and now it's a it's a it's a sort of uh, a, a whole uh, uh, subfield. I'll tell you more about this, but uh, recently. There is a, a, a new development, uh, uh, which, which is due to, to these folks here. Um, so so um, you see uh, uh, Peter Graham, David Kaplan, Surjit Rajendran. And uh, these were the guys who, who wrote a paper a few years back about uh, a particle called relaxions, which is, I love uh, play on words, and I guess it's, it's also a play on words. So you can see it has an axion. Uh, in it, but it's a, some kind of an axion that undergoes relaxation oscillations in the uh, early universe, so it's a relaxion. Uh, and uh, the reason they introduced uh, uh, this uh, is that, that there was their attempt to, to solve the hierarchy problem we have mentioned um, earlier. And um, it also became a very uh, popular sort of area uh, uh, of, uh, of science, and, 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 and my uh, 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 
collaborator and good friend Gilad Perez from the Weizmann Institute sort of uh, uh, developed his own version uh, of the relaxion. Uh, and um, th there is a particular aspect of, uh, uh, of the work of Gilad uh, and uh, collaborators, including Abhishek, whom you can see here. And uh, I did find your picture on the internet, Abhishek. <laughs> I, I was apologizing to Abhishek that I always have Gilad's picture and never his. And Abhishek said, don't worry, Gilad is be better looking anyway. So <laughs> but uh, you look good too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Anyway, um, there are certain uh, aspects um, about Gilad's work that are particularly um, uh, exciting uh, to me. So, um, Relaxion, uh, according to Gilad uh, and, and others, uh, solves hierarchy uh, problem and strong uh, CP problem uh, at the same time. Um, they think that it's very natural. Um, uh, and uh, they, they have uh, sort of a pre uh, preferred um, uh, a, a, a preferred uh, uh, mass range between 10 to minus 10 and 10 to minus 3. And this line is actually something uh, that is super, super exciting to me. So, um, you know, we are doing these uh, searches that look for uh, uh, spin rotation. Uh, that is sort of something that a pseudo scalar particle like Axion or Alp does. And uh, other people, uh, or including ourselves, uh, look for, uh, you know, uh, variation of alpha uh, is, uh, is something that scalar particles do. And we always wanted to do sort of a multi-sensor uh, kind of experiment, which is uh, particularly interesting in the context of um, uh, network uh, experiments that I'll talk about uh, later. And I, I, I've been bugging all my theory uh, friends for a very long time, uh, you know, can, uh, does it make sense to do clock and, 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 uh, and magnetometer uh, experiments at the same time? And they were eh, probably not, it's probably completely different things. And so, thank you, Gilad, he <laughs> said yes, uh, because uh, of uh, sort of intrinsic uh, parity violation of this um, uh, relaxions, maybe Abhishek can explain much better that mean they can turn uh, both uh, sides to us. Uh, and so these combined uh, networks uh, make sense. Um, and then uh, in, in, in the um, more recent work that was first done in the, uh, in the context of these relaxions, and actually uh, this paper uh, should have appeared uh, today. Uh, I don't know if it has or not, but that uh, it has. OK, uh, so this is very timely. Um, uh, with Abhishek, and Abhishek was actually the, the lead on this. Uh, we talk about possible enhancement of local density of dark matter due to the presence of the Earth uh, and the Sun. And, and more recently, this has been uh, e extended from Relaxion also to other things like, um, uh, it doesn't actually matter uh, what kind of, uh, but for this enhancement, it doesn't matter what kind of uh, bosonic uh, dark matter it is. And, and this is interesting because uh, if such enhancement really uh, occurs, that, that this makes all the uh, experiments looking for ultralight uh, bosonic dark matter much more sensitive than we originally thought. So it's a, another attractive feature here. So anyway, uh, when we learned uh, uh, from uh, Gilad about this, uh, and also uh, um, we learned that our uh, <coughs> friend Roy Ozeri at the Weizmann Institute has done a little quick experiment uh, to look for uh, relaxions. We, we started thinking, how can we do it? And we, we realized that actually there is a very simple uh, thing that can be done. Um, in fact, uh, originally we thought that we're going to do it over the weekend. Uh, so, so the name was invented, uh, the RESEL experiment, which stands, uh, stands for Weekend Relaxion Search Laboratory. In the end, you know, uh, this, I, I don't know if theorists know about this, uh, but experimentalists, of, of course, know there is a uh, pi and pi squared uh, factor, you know, so it's a, it's a sort of reality factor. If you think something is going to take certain time, in reality, it's going to take pi squared times, <laughs> times that if, if you're lucky. If you're super lucky, it's pi. Anyway, it, it took a month to, 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 to do this, but we did it, and uh, the team that worked on this uh, uh, 
is uh, uh, Dionysius Antipas. I already showed his um, picture in the context of uh, uh, iterbium parity violation. Then also Oleg Tretiak. Uh, uh, Roy Ozeri uh, was an active participant in this work via Skype. He kept us uh, honest um, what we were doing. And Antoine Garçon is another uh, graduate student uh, at Mainz. So uh, uh, the uh, I, uh, idea of this experiment, as I mentioned, that uh, there is a preferred uh, range uh, of, uh, of, of masses uh, for Gilad uh, relaxions, and they are sort of on the high side. And we, we started thinking about what uh, uh, would happen if, if uh, alpha effectively uh, changes rapidly. Okay, what, what is the, the signature and how, to, how to, to look for it? Uh, and imagine that you have a frequency uh, of, of some atomic transition and the levels are do doing this, right? This frequency would change. Um, and uh, if you have um, some kind of a, uh, an experiment where you have a laser that is locked to something that doesn't do this, okay, which is, which is stable, uh, then you can see this fast uh, oscillation uh, uh, fairly easily. And in fact, um, this may look uh, a little bit scary uh, to, to, to theories, but uh, in fact, every uh, person who is working with uh, frequency stabilized uh, laser has this kind of uh, arrangement in their lab, and, and you can find it commonly in undergraduate laboratories. This is something that's uh, called uh, Doppler-free uh, saturation spectroscopy. It's a, it's a little bit of a fancy version of that. Uh, this is called polarization spectroscopy, but, but basically uh, the idea is very simple, is that you have two uh, counter-propagating uh, beams that are extracted from the same uh, laser, and, and this arrangement actually allows you to eliminate the main mechanism of line broadening due to uh, thermal motion of atoms. That's why it's called uh, Doppler-free. And uh, the nice uh, thing about this arrangement is that uh, uh, so if your uh, uh, laser is, uh, is detuned with respect to atomic frequency, you have sort of a dispersively uh, looking uh, error signal. So you know if you are to the left of the resonance or to the right of the resonance naturally in this scheme. So we set this up. Um, and um, what you do is uh, you just basically uh, take this, uh, you, you, you lock the laser uh, to um, a stable cavity. Uh, and uh, you set this up, and you look at this error signal, and you feed it into a spectrum analyzer. And so really, without too much uh, effort, uh, we were able to, uh, at first, um, uh, look at frequencies, uh, let's say, uh, up to 10 uh, megahertz. And with uh, relative variation, we were sensitive to relative uh, variation in, in atomic frequency of a few times 10 to minus 15. And again, this is, this is uh, sort of uh, at the undergraduate uh, laboratory level of complexity. So currently, we are doing this uh, again uh, in a slightly more refined way. Uh, and we want to be at the 10 to minus 18 level. And this is coming along very well. Now, um, uh, you, you have a little bit of a, a, a dilemma here. So you can, uh, you can choose a transition that has uh, relatively uh, narrow uh, line widths. And uh, then you would have um, higher sensitivity uh, because you have a narrow resonance. And, and, and so your, your error signal is sharper. But um, uh, you would be limited in, in the uh, frequency. Or you can go to a broader resonance and, and probe a broader range of, of frequencies, as we did here. This is just a cesium uh, D2 line um, at uh, 852 nanometers. And here we were able to go um, all the way to 200 uh, megahertz at the same level. Or maybe, uh, uh, yeah, we, this was a little bit uh, uh, refined already compared to the previous ones. So, and of course, we, we saw some dark matter, uh, which caused some excitement. Uh, it turns out it was a, a systematic effect, as we were able um, to, to determine this is some, some kind of a um, uh, noise feature in the laser spectrum. But we, 
we ruled it out. Anyway, uh, these are uh, fairly uh, simple experiments, and, and we think that everybody uh, will be doing the, these now as well. So uh, it's, it was published uh, uh, just recently uh, in PRL. Um, as we were thinking uh, about uh, uh, this experiment, we uh, actually came uh, across uh, certain, uh, at first we, we thought that these were paradoxes. Um, and um, in, the, in this field of constant variation of constants, uh, you have certain um, rules, certain notions. For instance, people will tell you that only dim uh, dimensional, dimensionless constants are allowed to vary. Because you, you may want to talk about the, the change of, of, of the length of some, some object, right? But uh, how do you know if the object is changing or the ruler uh, or the unit is changing? You, you can. But if you, if you take a ratio uh, of, uh, of two uh, lengths, for example, then, uh, then, it does, uh, then it's sort of uh, invariant. And this has been, it's written in all the papers about variation of constants that you can only talk about variation uh, of dimensionless constants. But uh, actually, this is no longer true uh, if you are uh, talking about uh, fast variations of uh, constants. Because uh, you can, <coughs> and if you want to read about it, it's, it's in here. Uh, uh, because uh, now you can, uh, if, if um, something is changing rapidly on the scale of the experiment. Now what you can do is you can form, again, sort of this um, uh, dimensionless ratio of uh, in instantaneous value of some uh, parameter to its time average value. So your, your fast oscillation, it brings uh, sort of uh, uh, a, a new um, notion here. Uh, and, and now you can actually talk about variation of M and variation um, uh, of, of, of electric charge, if you like, uh, and so on. Well, I'm showing you ratios, but now I can, I can tell you that it's the mass of electron uh, uh, is changing, right? I, compared to the average so, uh, yeah, yeah, compared to the average. So before it w was always like Me over Mp specifically. Well, alpha uh, was always OK, but uh, for instance, now we can write electric charge here. And um, uh, uh, in, in order to see how this whole bu uh, business works, actually, it's a little bit tricky because it's not, um, in a sense, a fundamental variation of constants. What you have to do is you have to, to go uh, to a level of uh, uh, the Lagrangian and introduce your fields and then see what, what they do and whether you can actually uh, are allowed to write uh, these things as variation of constants or not. And it's, it's a little bit tricky, but uh, if uh, Gilad is your friend, he can, he can do it for you. And uh, uh, in fact, this is all traced in this paper uh, very nicely, uh, how, how this works. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Uh, so. Like I said, it's a little bit tricky. Right. Um, so now I would like to talk uh, a little bit uh, about the uh, networks uh, of sensors. So of course, uh, it is always good to have more, more than one uh, uh, sensor. Uh, uh, okay. And even um, if, the, if, the, if dark matter is coherent over the size of the Earth, you know, it, it's very nice to, to, to measure with one detector and then with another detector. Uh, but uh, if uh, dark matter has some uh, non-trivial uh, topology, then uh, networks are really essential. Um, and uh, I'll tell you uh, uh, this, the story of how um, the first uh, one of these came about. Um, so with two of my students, uh, Derek Kimball, who is uh, at the Cal State East Bay, uh, and uh, Shimon Pustelny, who is now a 
professor uh, uh, at, 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 at the uh, Gilonian University in Krakow. We were sitting in my office at Berkeley, uh, and uh, we were thinking about uh, the uh, magnetometry, the science of magnetometry. And we made uh, the following observations, that we, we worked very hard to build uh, a magnetometer. Uh, in, the, uh, in that case, it was an atomic magnetometer that's as sensitive as you can, uh, as you can uh, make it. And then, in order to, to, to see that it's sensitive, to test it, we, we actually put it inside uh, the best magnetic shield we can make. So, so it doesn't, it's not perturbed by the, 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 the fields in the lab. And it's kind of funny. So you, you have a sensitive device, and then you shield it from the fields. And then you look at the signal, and most of the time you're looking at noise. And uh, this is a very strange thing to look at noise. Uh, because if you stare at, uh, at noise, you know, you start seeing things. And once in a while, you say, whoo, so there's something, something, you think something is there. And so we had this, uh, this really strange idea that suppose we, uh, we, we sit at Berkeley and look at our noise, and then Shimik sits at Krakow and looks at his noise. Um, what if we, uh, whenever we you know, think we see something, we somehow correlate these things? Um, and uh, uh, is, is it useful for, for something? And um, we, we kind of really immediately liked uh, aesthetically uh, this idea. But we didn't know what it's good for. And um, we started uh, bugging all our theory friends. And uh, all the theory friends had a very interesting reaction. They said, oh, it's a beautiful idea. There must be something interesting that this, this measures. And uh, uh, then uh, nobody will, would come, come back to us uh, and say what it is. And finally, one theory friend, uh, friend um, Maxim Paspelov, he said, aha, I know what, what you, are, you guys, you can look for. And, and that is um, uh, the uh, axion-like particle domain walls. And the idea is uh, that, um, uh, in, in, in principle, uh, uh, if you have this uh, alp field, there is this uh, something that's called the, the winding number uh, for it. And it could be different in different parts uh, of the of the universe, and and then the universe would be like uh, like um, uh, you know if you like uh, condensed matter, the uh, ferromagnetic domains, uh, or if you like uh, cheese, uh, maybe you would think about the different parts of cheese, you know, with um, yeah. But anyway, uh, uh, so so the so the these different domains w would have uh, basically allowed values of this alp field, uh, but. If you go from one to another, uh, uh, th there is a domain wall uh, where the, uh, the, there has to be a rapid uh, change um, uh, of, of, of the field. And, and um, there is a lot of tension in this wall. And so the idea that was proposed at some point that dark matter could be uh, the energy in these domain walls. And um, then uh, Maxim said uh, that, OK, good. Uh, there is a very large gradient uh, of the uh, uh, axion field when you go through the wall, and it should uh, rotate the spins. Um, and, and so we uh, got together and uh, um, wrote a paper, and we had a very nice title uh, for it. Um, uh, that was, uh, how, how do you know that you crash through the wall or something like this? And we submitted it to PRL, and after uh, one round of uh, 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 discussion with the referees, it was accepted. So we are expecting our paper, uh, how, how do you know that you crash through the wall to appear on PRL? Uh, and then it does. No, uh, but they never, t they never told us. And, and when it appeared, there was a, a, a terrible, uh, terrible uh, title that didn't even make any sense in, in English. I forgot what it is, but uh, yeah. But anyway, uh, so that's how this, uh, this whole business um, um, uh, appeared. And then there was um, uh, a lot of developments since. So one is that um, uh, the, these uh, axion dom domain walls are, 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 are sort of a little bit of a fringe, because most people think that they cannot really survive um, from the early universe. Uh, there are some different opinions about this. But, but, there, uh, but then later on, there was a realization that there is a lot of other 
uh, things that you uh, can search for, uh, and these are some bound uh, uh, states uh, like uh, uh, Q balls or axion stars and so on. And, and so the, these searches are ongoing um, uh, and uh, uh, kind of uh, in an active way. Another uh, really major development was that, um, I guess, uh, after uh, this magnetometer network um, started working, um, people kept uh, thinking about it, and uh, Maxim, the same Maxim Paspelov, uh, and Andrei Derivenko, they wrote uh, a paper about uh, uh, a network of clocks um, with the same idea, but a different portal, so to say. So now it's a scalar search. And, and uh, immediately, uh, yeah, I was trying to convince them that it should all be united, you know, and, and they would say, no, no, no. Uh, now, now, remember, uh, with the relaxions, it makes sense. But um, anyway, um, there are now uh, lots of clock networks, um, uh, and one of them is a very interesting one. It's, uh, it's called uh, GPS.dm, uh, and we have a member of that collaboration, Connor, uh, here, um, who has done a lot of analysis uh, for this. And um, uh, the idea is that there is a, a, already an existing uh, uh, network uh, of GPS uh, atomic clocks. And you can do a couch experiment with it, right? So <laughs> the, the data uh, are there. And, and so the, uh, this group has been uh, doing a lot of interesting analysis. And now we are also um, combining this with, uh, with the norms, so magnetometers and, and clocks. So uh, the, the GNOME uh, network currently consists of about a dozen uh, stations uh, all over the world. Um, so there are uh, two at Berkeley, one at Hayward, and one at Los Angeles. And um, uh, uh, on, the, on the East Coast, uh, we have a station in Mainz and Krakow, uh, and so on. And we have uh, two stations in uh, China and one in Korea. Uh, and uh, this, this network uh, is currently uh, growing. And um, uh, so there, there, there were some pr uh, preliminary analysis of the, of the data that were published. But uh, in the last year, I would say, or a couple of years, uh, the analysis has been uh, taken a, a, to a completely uh, different uh, level. And one of the people responsible for this, Joseph Smiga, is right here. So you can ask him. Uh, questions uh, about it, and uh, so uh, there's something I, I did not uh, realize because I I was uh, um, uh, silly and, and and naive, and now I'm not 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 so naive anymore. But um, uh, anyway, uh, that, uh, uh, that censorship, yeah, uh, that uh, the, the it's actually not so hard to build. Uh, a bunch of sensors and start taking data and recording the data. But, but the real, um, real difficulty, sort of the real bottleneck in this kind of work is data analysis. It's, it's, uh, I, I just, uh, we, we, we had some, uh, some ideas about how to do uh, data analysis. Well, our observation was that, oh, look, uh, LIGO uh, is also a network of sensors. Um, and uh, they, they have figured out how to do this. And in fact, we had some people from the LIGO collaboration part as part of the GNOME collaboration. And we decided, oh, we're going to use the software that's publicly available and well advertised by LIGO. Well, you know, what happens with software is some uh, postdoc writes a program and then graduates and leaves. And then uh, it somehow works, and nobody uh, then knows what's inside of it. And actually, we, we had a, a huge disaster uh, trying to use uh, LIGO uh, data analysis uh, packages that, that uh, led us to, to waste you know, a couple of years of our precious lives. And so now um, our own students have uh, you know, completely redone this, uh, and, and now it's working. Uh, so uh, the collaboration, uh, out of this crazy idea, you know, a big Collaboration has uh, has formed, and uh, we have annual meetings. And this one, this year, uh, pro last year, it was in Mainz. Um, so this, you know, a few dozen scientists. So it's a it's a it's an exciting time uh, for GNOME, um, and serious um, um, results should be coming uh, already this year. Uh, I, I I would like to say.
So this is the, the paper uh, describing this new analysis method, and this is uh, Joey over there. So yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, now I'd like to tell you about something completely different, as they say. But uh, um, uh, are there any questions? So you can take advantage of the fact that uh, uh, Connor and Joey are here and ask them questions as, as well. Or you can ask those questions later. You can ask me also. Right. Um, so now I'd like, if it, so all, all of the stuff I was talking to you about, consider it normal. Now the crazy stuff comes. There is not no laughter. It's scary. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so th this idea. Let me see what what do we have here. Okay. So uh, so so uh, it, it is scary. So uh, this person uh, here is Professor uh, Alan uh, Mills uh, from the University of California Riverside, and he is a very famous experimentalist in the area of uh, positron and positronium physics. So antimatter people know him very well. So I, I met uh, Alan last year uh, at Berkeley, and uh, uh, we uh, were chatting about uh, what uh, we are doing. And, and when he learned that we are looking for uh, dark matter, he said, you know, I've had uh, an idea several years ago, but I never was able to sort of pursue it. And he told me the idea, and I liked it so much that we decided uh, to, to actually do something about it. And the idea is this. So um, people tell us that dark matter uh, doesn't really interact with normal matter, OK? Um, so suppose. Uh, uh, we have some kind of dark matter object. I like to think ab about elephants. You already, uh, you already saw some elephants uh, in my slides. So I'm thinking about dark matter elephant. And suppose I, I bring the dark matter elephant and let, let the elephant go. So it's attracted by the Earth's gravity, right? And then uh, it wouldn't interact with the Earth. It will go right through. Uh, and then go through the center of the Earth, and then it'll come back and start oscillating like this. Now, uh, many of us, uh, when we were uh, first taking physics, uh, solved the problem. So if you dr uh, drill sort of a tunnel to the center uh, of the Earth, um, you know, and, and uh, you can calculate when, when, the, when you drop your laser pointer, or, or you know, when will the laser pointer come back? And it's like 90 minutes or something. Like this, assuming uh, that the Earth uh, is um, uh, of uniform density. Now it gets better because uh, if you consider an object moving inside a uniform sphere, the potential is a three-dimensional harmonic oscillator. And in fact, this period uh, wouldn't depend on any details of the trajectory as long as it's within the Earth. You know, It doesn't matter whether it's linear or some kind of a uh, any any kind of trajectory will have the same period, and so um, then uh, the next step. Uh, suppose we do have this dark matter elephant sloshing around in the Earth. Uh, the Earth uh, on the surface of the Earth, there is a. Uh, it happens to be a, a, a network of super precise gravimeters, and these gravimeters are uh, so-called superconducting gravimeters. These are um, spheres uh, that are held uh, uh, in, in, in place, uh, and, and uh, there are uh, coils sort of that apply magnetic fields to, to keep them uh, stationary. Uh, and they were developed in the in 1960s, and they have reached um, an enormous precision uh, of about 10 to minus 12 g, or even better. G is the uh, free fall acceleration. Uh, for one second measurement. And there is a big network of them, and they are producing data all the time, and they are making the data available for you to, to go and play with. What for? What, what was the purpose uh, of 
uh, the purpose study of the Earth is geology. It's uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, you know earthquakes and uh, and then uh, studying uh, the the modes of the Earth, which is a super interesting. Uh, I'm I'm just reading about it, and it's very very interesting and very important also. Uh, and then some some practical stuff like monitoring nuclear explosions is also good uh, for that. Um, anyway, um, so we decided to see what we can do, and uh, and uh, but uh, the, 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 you, at, f at first you you get a, a real shock because this approximation that the the density of the Earth is uniform is so bad you can't believe it. So go to the Wikipedia and then you. You can see this <coughs> this picture. It shows the density. So uh, density one is water, of course, and uh, if you are uh, on the uh, surface, the average density is about three three point something, three point five. Um, but then, as you go inside uh, the Earth, you know you go um, uh, through the through the mantle, and then there is a core. There is about halfway uh, into the Earth. There is a jump by about a factor of two. In the density, and then you you um, uh, the, you go there's liquid core, and then there is solid core, and and you end up uh, with a density almost 14. So from from three uh, to 14. So the, the the approximation that the Earth density is uniform uh, is, is really really bad. Okay. Uh, actually, it, it's it's another interesting thing is suppose you take a uh, gravimeter and you make uh, a tunnel and you go with this gravimeter down. So you would naively expect that g uh, drops, right? It doesn't. Okay, so at first it increases, then it drops because of this non uniformity. Amazing. Anyway, so you, you would think, okay, my, uh, or in this case, Alan's uh, idea is dead, right? Uh, but you can save it, of course, because uh, if you now assume that your dark uh, matter elephant is sloshing around here with a small amplitude, it's about one tenth. Uh, then you can say that the density is approximately uh, approximately uniform uh, over there, and that then the density is higher, uh, and so the period is now 55 minutes, not 80 minutes, but 55 minutes. But you can still try to look for it. Um, right. Um, this is the uh, very very complex formula from sixth grade for the period. Uh, yeah. Good. So this is uh, uh, the network uh, of uh, uh, gravimeters. It, it's, uh, it's called iGets for some reason. Uh, there are about 40 of these things operating currently. Um, and there's, uh, in, in our analysis, we, we, uh, we use maybe 400 uh, station years uh, uh, of data. Uh, we had a summer student who did some Nice modeling uh, of the of the spectrum. Um, so this uh, uh, 55 uh, minutes corresponds to 0.3 uh, millihertz, and uh, due to the rotation of the Earth, uh, there is a splitting uh, due to the fact that the uh, potential is non um, uh, due to the density being non-uniform. Uh, you can also have uh, harmonics of the signal, so that's sort of the predicted spectrum. Uh, and then this is the real data, um, and uh, you can you can look uh, in the region of interest and and uh, uh, and uh, analyze uh, what's going on. So you can see a, a lot of uh, uh, different uh, things here. So for instance, you see all of a sudden a sharp resonance at about 0.8 hertz, uh, and it turns out that this is actually uh, the radial deformation mode of the Earth. And believe it or not, it has a Q factor of about 6,000. It's a super sharp uh, resonance. And this gives you some ideas about uh, how um, you might be able to use the, the Earth resonator to, to enhance the sensitivity to certain kinds of dark uh, matter. Anyway, so uh, you can find this on the archive. Uh, we did it. Uh, and now you, you would think. This, uh, this is such a crazy thing that uh, only, only a very small number of crazy people would, would, would actually ever, ever do this. Um, and uh, the day we put our paper, uh, you know, we're about actually to submit it to the archive, uh, we found out that we are not the only crazy people. And, 
and we uh, we actually uh, uh, looked at this paper, and I happen to know uh, this person. Um, he's a professor at the Indiana University, Chuck Horowitz. I I, I called him up. Uh, we we pulled the two papers next to each other, and we both. Uh, we, well, I guessed before uh, when I saw his paper, but then he guessed when we saw uh, when he saw our paper because figures are the same one after another. So. So it turned out that we did completely the same thing and completely independently, or, or maybe not completely. Maybe maybe we heard some talks uh, uh, of you know sometimes ideas circulate. But anyway, it's a very interesting thing. We we've been talking uh, with Chuck about possibly maybe joining forces in the future to 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 take this to a better uh, level. So th this uh, I think is very uh, uh, nice, but it has a, uh, a, a theoretical. Uh, issue, uh, which is very important, and maybe uh, some of you in the audience can uh, uh, take a crack at uh, uh, how to solve this. Um, so, if if, the, if you have this dark matter uh, elephant trapped in the earth, that's no problem. But how do you get it trapped? Because if it's uh, somewhere in the in the orbit, you know it will just go go through and would not get trapped. Um, so we, we are thinking about uh, uh, some 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 mechanisms. There are some some mechanisms that um, actually uh, in work in principle. It's just uh, uh, hard to make them work numerically. Uh, one of them is um, tidal forces uh, in the Earth. So when the elephant uh, goes into the Earth, it uh, it deforms the Earth, and some of the energy is lost. And so if you somehow uh, get it, this this thing to work for for a while, this um, this in principle works, out, and even in a beautiful way, um, because uh, if the amplitude of the of the elephant is large, uh, the losses are large, but uh, as it uh, 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 the amplitude uh, uh, of oscillation shrinks and it starts oscillating near the center, the loss turns itself off. So then, then you can basically, in principle, uh, both capture it and, and then have it oscillating with high Q eventually. So what we want, but uh, numbers don't <laughs> don't work very well. But you can see the appendix in our paper discussing this. Right. Uh, any questions about that? So again, um, we don't do the experiment here. We take the data that that exists uh, on the archive. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, we also learned um, um, that uh, there is a group at uh, Columbia uh, who is also looking at, the, at this kind of thing. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, somehow, this uh, use of gravimeters for dark matter search is uh, in the in the air. So uh, is somehow is an idea uh, that is ripe now. All right, um, so uh, I would like to share with you something that I myself uh, learned uh, last year. Um, and uh, this is actually a very fascinating thing. Uh, and it's a completely different framework uh, for dark matter, totally different from, from uh, everything else. And this is uh, Axion uh, Quark Nuggets. The, uh, I already mentioned that the champion is Ariel Zitnitsky. Uh, so uh, one of the uh, canonical axion uh, uh, types is DFSZ, standing for Dian Fischer Srednicki Zitnitsky. So he's basically an axion um, pioneer. And what uh, he tells us is that um, uh, QCD, okay, the, the theory of strong interactions, uh, has different uh, solutions. So we are all familiar with nuclear uh, matter, you know, neutrons, protons, and so on. But there is uh, another uh, solution that may have existed uh, uh, in, uh, in the uh, early universe, and um, uh, it's called the, uh, I, I don't actually understand the meaning of, 
of the words. Maybe somebody can help here. Uh, but it's called um, uh, chiral condensate. Chiral condensate. And uh, it's, uh, it's sort of a, uh, a, 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 a different um, uh, uh, kind of a, of a structure. But um, <coughs> uh, it, it, according to, to Ariel, it's not, not uh, new physics. It's, it's sort of basic, uh, basic um, uh, QCD. And so uh, some years ago, uh, Witten uh, has proposed that some of this uh, phase survives somehow from the early universe to, till this day and maybe uh, dark uh, matter. And uh, this original theory uh, had some problems because it was very, very difficult to, to, uh, uh, to explain how, how, the, how this phase survives um, till today. And uh, Zhitnitsky solved this problem by combining, um, combining this uh, 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 phase uh, with uh, an axion domain wall which comes in the form of the bubble. So basically, the, uh, the axions um, uh, hold together the pieces of this um, uh, uh, phase. Um, and <coughs> his hypothesis is that this is what uh, dark uh, matter is. Now, um, what is this object? So he uh, um, uh, looks at the uh, parameter space and he says that sort of some uh, numbers that he likes is that the baryon number of this thing uh, is about 10 to the 25. So 10 to the 25 quarks or anti-quarks. Uh, and uh, the density is basically like uh, uh, nuclear matter uh, density. Uh, and so the size of this thing uh, is almost microscopic. Macroscopic, sorry. Uh, it's about 10 to minus 5 uh, uh, centimeter. Uh, and uh, the um, funny thing about this is that uh, while we normally think of dark matter of something that interacts very weakly, this thing interacts like crazy. Okay, So uh, this has an interaction uh, cross-section of basically this uh, pi times uh, r squared. So it's about 10 to minus 3 times 10 to minus uh, 10 square centimeters. And um, if it uh, hits the Earth, and uh, uh, this is anti-quarks here, there's annihilation uh, that is going on. But uh, when it starts going through the Earth, it, it gradually uh, annihilates. Uh, but there's 10 to, 10 to the 25 anti-quarks to annihilate. And so it can actually go through the Earth and only lose some percent of its energy. So if you calculate what kind of energy uh, this is, it's about um, uh, something like 10 to the 5 joule per centimeter. And if you multiply by the you know, diameter of the Earth, you see that this is basically a, uh, a small nuclear uh, explosion. But it's not localized. It's uh, several thousand kilometers uh, long. OK, and now comes uh, something that is very strange. And at first, you, you want to sort of object to this. But uh, according to Zitnitsky, this solves essentially all the problems uh, that we have. So for instance, uh, how, 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 can it be, uh, how can it be dark matter if it interacts strongly? OK, how, what is? Um, so apparently, astrophysics um, uh, doesn't limit the, uh, the interaction cross-section. It, 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 it limits the, the ratio of the cross-section to mass. And, uh, and this is so massive per, uh, per unit of cross-section that, that it actually very nicely fits the astrophysics limits. That's one thing. The other thing is um, uh, uh, sort of depending on uh, some parameters in the early universe, uh, uh, these uh, nuggets could be either quarks or, or anti-quarks. Um, and if it's anti-quarks, that's where the antimatter is. OK? So we don't see it because it's in, in these nuggets. Moreover, uh, the, the, this puzzle, why we have approximately the same amount of uh, matter uh, and antimatter is also solved naturally. And it goes on and on and on. Uh, and according to him, basically all the problems are solved. So now, um, I uh, am generally 
very skeptical about any uh, everything. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Mr. Skeptic, right? Uh, and uh, I've been asking uh, people to, you know, poke holes in this and uh, and, and see why this is not uh, the case. And and I, I I am yet to find somebody who would have any ob uh, objections to this. Uh, he does. Okay, this is above my pay grade. But uh, Ariel is a wonderful uh, uh, person in the, in the sense that if you ask him a question, he he's v extremely uh, uh, willing uh, to to explain. And uh, uh, when he first was starting uh, uh, started to try to sell me on this, I I I I I really as an experimentalist, I I tried to poke uh, huge holes in this, and that, that was. You know, super interesting because we would talk for hours. I would come with up with arguments, uh, uh, and and he would have numerical answers to everything. So I uh, <laughs> encourage you to to ask him about this. Um, anyway, um, uh, so there it is, and the question is how to look for it. Um, the, another interesting thing uh, uh, to 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 emphasize once again that there is uh, no BSM physics in this. According to Ariel, only the axion, but axions are, are familiar now, so it's almost like a standard <laughs> model. <clears throat> anyway, um, uh, uh, so the, these discussions led to um, uh, uh, a paper uh, that we put on the archive uh, last year. But um, I, I think uh, I don't really uh, like our basic idea here, is because uh, 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 this is a search. Um, for uh, these nuggets based on the uh, axions that they produce. And uh, to me, it's a little bit uh, 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 pathological because uh, this thing is basically a nuclear explosion. Why look for it through axions that uh, interact very weakly? Uh, so now we are actually uh, uh, working very hard on, 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 uh, on more sane methods of detection. But some of, uh, some of the ideas uh, using the, the global networks uh, that we formulated there should apply there as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, there are many solutions, I think. Yes. Good. Um, OK. Um, so uh, any questions about, about that? And it would be strange not to have questions. <laughs> Yes, Joey. So, uh, if you have, say, one of these perk nuggets passing through a person, how much energy would that deposit? I mean, would this be comparable to, say, like, a bullet passing through a person? Would it be lethal? Yeah. Uh, yes. So, this is, uh, this is uh, a very interesting um, question. Um, so the the energy is is large. So it's uh it's about um, uh, it's about ten to the five uh, joule uh, per centimeter that's lost. Okay, so you have a few centimeters. So you you basically have a mega joule, but <laughs> but 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 uh, what happens is that uh, you have these annihilation uh, products, and in fact it, it has been calculated what they are, and some. Some of these things are gammas, and the gammas uh, they have uh, they have a, a fairly large range. So so a lot of the, this energy will actually go out, uh, and we have uh, currently uh, big debates about uh, whether it will kill you or not. Uh, now um, the, I forgot to tell you uh, that um, sort of the th these things are so heavy that in order to uh, reconcile this with, with 0.4 GeV. Uh, uh, per cubic centimeter, you have um, maybe uh, if you have a 30 kilometer square, 30 kilometer square area, well, one of these things comes through uh, every year, once once per year. Um, uh, yeah, so so it's un unlikely it will it will hit you, but uh, uh, you know who is a who is a great enthusiast of this uh, framework is Costas Ziutas. Um, uh, he he's really pushing it and and uh, and uh, looking at the you know uh, rates of disease and and death and so on. yes. <laughs> Could you search for these with uh, monopole detectors? 
you have, you know, like uh, you have some ancient mineral that's been around for billions of years, shielded. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's a great, uh, it's a great way to do this. I think uh, paleo detection. Absolutely. Uh, I'm a big uh, proponent of this, and uh, so so we are really talking. Uh, very intensely with uh, Victor Flambaum and uh, uh, Ariel currently about how to how to uh, really best detect these things, but this is a very good idea. Yeah, absolutely. So what I can see is one annually in, in 30 square kilometers. How come we don't see? Um, how come you just don't see it? people don't see it on the street? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, so this is a question of how dramatic. Uh, this event uh, would be, you know, what, what, what really, wh whether it's uh, going to be an explosion or not, and maybe not. Um, and then, uh, then it's probably hard to, to observe it. And it's also very rare. And crazy things happen without explanation sometimes. <laughs> okay. Um, Uh, it's uh, uh, it's maybe uh, one uh, per uh, thirty square kilometers per year or something. Like this. It, it, that's uh, you can calculate yourself from uh, the point four. Uh, so the, so they, they this is uh, they also move with ten to minus three uh, c and and the, uh, the density average density is point four GeV per cubic centimeter and if it's ten to the twenty five uh, quarks uh, basically so you. You can do the calculation, but it, it comes down to about uh, uh, one per uh, thirty square kilometer per year. Yeah. Well, this is this uh, this is this other solution uh, of uh, of uh, QCD that is not uh, hadrons, but it's another phase in QCD. Sorry, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's totally above my uh, pay grade. I. Uh, um, can tell you more, uh, except uh, apparently it's a standard thing in QCD. All right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You mentioned this probably produces a signature not unlike a nuclear explosion with uh, gamma like events. Yeah. Absolutely. Th the the, there are papers and uh, gravimeters and whatnot. There are, so, so there are papers. Is the signature is very different because it's a it's a nuclear explosion that's ten thousand kilometers long. So it's a very different signature. Um, and again, uh, so, so currently we are calculating actually how much sound, is, uh, how much uh, energy will go into sound, how much into uh, this, the this, the, the diff defects in the material uh, and so on. So it's, <coughs> but certainly uh, this uh, this is a, a actually an interesting thing uh, um, that um, uh, not so many people. Uh, there are some some real enthusiasts of this, uh, like uh, uh, like Costas Ziutas, but but not so many people uh, work on this because this some, somehow falls uh, in the cracks between areas of expertise. For example. Um, my understanding is that you know BSM phenomenologists they they don't like to work in QCD somehow and uh, you know <laughs> I don't know <laughs> yeah okay uh, so there's one more topic that I wanted to uh, discuss with you today uh, and this is dark matter search uh, with antimatter and I'm super excited about this. Uh, forget for <laughs> the the, the uh, uh, exciting topic of uh, anti quark nuggets. Let's go back to uh, bosonic fields, for example. Um, and uh, this experiment here uh, that uh, there was what is happening? That's it. <coughs> um, I'm sorry. Yes. So um, uh, this was just uh, just published um, on the 14th of 
uh, November. Uh, this is an, an experiment that was, um, actually it's another couch experiment, okay? So uh, this is an analysis of the uh, data uh, taken by the base uh, collaboration, CERN-based uh, base collaboration. And, and these guys, um, what they are doing uh, is um, they have uh, actually a pair uh, of antiprotons that they store uh, in these magnetic traps. Uh, and they do uh, highly precise measurements uh, of magnetic moment of antiproton. And then uh, there is a, a sort of a copy of this machine that has uh, protons. It's in mines. And then they compa compare uh, the magnetic moment uh, of the antiproton with the magnetic uh, moment of the proton. Um, and the goal is the search uh, for uh, CPT violation. This is one of the best uh, tests of CPT uh, <coughs> invariance. And so uh, based on all of this uh, CASPER and whatnot, uh, there appeared an idea uh, to, to, to look at their data and see if one can um, uh, actually detect uh, spin precession signatures due to uh, axions or axion-like particles. And um, so the people who uh, led this analysis was Christian Smora, who is one of the active members of the base uh, collaboration, and Evgeny Stadnik, who was uh, then a postdoc uh, with our group at, uh, at Mainz and is now uh, in Japan, actually, at, in the Institute of uh, Physics and Mathematics of uh, the Universe. Um, and. Um, so uh, let me see if I have, yes. So uh, these are some results. So the, the, the bottom line uh, of this is that uh, if you uh, assume uh, that there is basically no difference between matter and antimatter, this is not a very impressive experiment. It may be about three orders of magnitude um, less sensitive than other uh, experiments. But um, you know, we have this in your face asymmetry between matter and antimatter. And intellectually, it would be super nice uh, to explore if uh, dark matter somehow selectively uh, interacts with uh, antimatter. And it's, it's, uh, in principle, it is possible. It is hard to do uh, on, 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 on the sort of Lagrangian basis. But if you somehow, um, well, uh, the, the, what we just talked about, for instance, the anti-quark nuggets, is, uh, it's, uh, it's an example of how you can have uh, dark matter that fully asymmetrically interacts with matter and antimatter because it's just basically anti-quarks. Uh, so it is an interesting thing to look about. And this is the first uh, direct limit uh, for uh, interaction of dark uh, matter uh, and antimatter. And I think uh, other people again will uh, will take this banner uh, currently and, and, and go with it and this will uh, further improve and certainly there is a lot of theoretical thinking that that uh, would probably be good to put uh, into this possibility of a, a, um, asymmetric uh, dark matter uh, interactions um, all right so uh, that's basically uh, all I wanted to tell you. And uh, just can maybe go to a little uh, uh, summary and, and tell you. Well, actually, there are a couple more things I would like to mention without uh, going into detail. So this was uh, dark matter search with antimatter. I'm very excited about this. Uh, we also discussed uh, what we think is an important realization. Um, are slowly uh, oscillating uh, dark matter that is basically uh, in some ways analogous to chaotic light and you have to to think about it when you do experimental limits because uh, you can do an experiment and not measure anything not because dark matter is not there but because you are looking when it's dark uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a bad uh, time um, so there is uh, a possible enhancement of the uh, density um, of dark matter due to the Earth uh, and the Sun. Uh, this is Abhishek's uh, work. Uh, I did not talk about it, but this is ongoing. Um, uh, you can uh, actually uh, uh, 
search for dark uh, matter uh, using uh, uh, active uh, nuclear masers. And I, I believe uh, going from a passive um, NMR type detection to active NMR type detection in principle should not lead to, to any fundamental uh, advantages, but there are a lot of technical advantages uh, for doing this. Um, and so this experiment is uh, currently being analyzed. There's, the data have been taken already, so this will be coming out uh, pretty soon. Uh, I would also like uh, to mention that it's possible uh, to look for dark matter in very uh, indirect ways. And uh, uh, Pavel Fadeev here is uh, uh, the guy who's been working on this for, for a couple of years now. Uh, and uh, the idea is uh, that um, if you have uh, pa uh, particles um, and um, uh, dark matter is made of something like, uh, you know, dark photons or axions or some other exotic thing, uh, th this should not only be uh, uh, present uh, around us as the background field, they should also be produced virtually. And this leads uh, to exotic in, uh, interactions, a fifth force type interactions between things. Um, uh, some of them are spin dependent, some of them are velocity dependent. Uh, and this idea, I believe, goes back to, to a paper by Moody and, and Wilczek in 1980s, yeah? Yes. Uh, uh, and, and they saw, so they wrote some uh, examples uh, of these potentials and other uh, authors like uh, uh, Dabrescu and, and Moschau have uh, sort of generalized and expanded this, but there were some issues uh, with these uh, uh, potentials. And uh, uh, Pavel and uh, company, Victor Flambaum and others, um, have put hopefully some order uh, into this. So there's a new catalog if you're interested uh, in this here. and. Um, there were some uh, interesting applications uh, of this. Uh, one uh, is I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about. Actually, um, there is a, a beautiful experimental system uh, which is called uh, antiprotonic helium. Okay, uh, it's um, a relatively long-lived uh, system where uh, where where you have helium. Uh, nucleus, an antiproton, and an electron. Uh, and uh, antiproton, when it's uh, um, uh, caught in the, uh, a high uh, orbit, high, high n principal quantum number orbit, it has the, uh, approximately the same size as the, as the electron. And, and you have this exotic atom, and you can do spectroscopy. And what we have done is the, what, guess what, Couch experiment. Uh, with it, uh, so uh, there, there are people who have done beautiful uh, theoretical calculations of the uh, spectrum, uh, and uh, there are uh, people who have done very precise spectroscopic measurements. And all we needed to do is to take these exotic potentials and calculate the matrix element using the the, the wave functions uh, that um, people have. Um, derived and 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 then uh, see if there are any exotic interactions. So we 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 set uh, actually first uh, limits on this semi-leptonic uh, uh, exotic interactions um, of antimatter. By the way, this was actually a follow-up on um, um, on a similar work in, in normal uh, helium, uh, where we uh, looked at the exotic uh, electron electron interactions in a similar way. Yes. Thirty. 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 For for antiproton. Uh, right? So, so thirty squared. Because the four radius is set by an electron. Yeah. So you need to get a factor of Yeah. It's a yes. The thirty, yeah. 30. Yeah. Exactly. Uh all right. Um so this was all about elephants, right? Uh some of them flying through the earth and some of them are um yeah. Philosophical elephants. Um, this is again uh, the ultralight bosonic dark matter that is analogous to uh, chaotic light. You need to make corrections. 
this is the Russell experiment, uh, gravimeters, uh, and the weird distribution of the density in the Earth, uh, anti-quark nuggets, and uh, we'll stop here. I think it annihilates. Yeah. It goes in one by one. What do you mean one by one? No, I think it just. Uh, I think it just annihilates. Oh, so what L is it? No, I think uh, what what L do you remember? It's uh, it's also high. I think it's high. It's like a Rydberg state. Yeah, it's uh, the the guy who does these experiments is Masaki Hori. And there are several very nice papers uh, about the experiment. And again, we have, you know, we had nothing to do with the experiment. We took his uh, beautiful data and just did our analysis with his gothic potential. Coming back to your gravimeter network, <coughs> how massive and how compact do these elephants have to be in order for you to have sensitivity? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, w w our current limits are something like 10 to the 13 kilogram or something like this. Uh, but you can do much better. Um, so I think um, uh, the, the Earth is at like 20, uh, 10 to the 27, if I remember, kilograms. So it's ten to like, uh, um, yeah, correspondingly a very small fraction, uh, 10, uh, 10, to my, uh, 10 to the 27 and 10 to the 13. So 10 to minus 14 uh, of the mass of the, of the Earth. But um, I think if you uh, want to be super optimistic, right, and you get this 10 to minus 12 G per second and 40 gravimeters in many, many years, you can in principle get down to, if you are limited by the gravimeters to something like 10 to the 8 kilograms, so really impressive, several orders of magnitude better than we have now. But that's not a problem. The problem is seismic noise. You know, the Earth is very dynamic. And you have to actually, already at our level, we have to, to think about it's not being a, a, a rigid Earth, but, you know, being a bunch of uh, elastic resonators, basically. And so figuring that out and, and, and taking out this uh, seismic background is the, is the core of the problem. It's not the sensitivity, actually. Uh, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> possibilities, um, um, but we, we haven't looked at everything, right? I, I don't know. But flybys, I don't know. But Abhishek looked at some uh, some stuff like the, like this.